This is your Bar Minister Day Weekly Update for Friday, November 12. So glad you could join us. To former senior employees in the Ministry of People Empowerment and Elderly Affairs, today admitted to giving the go-ahead for monies to be used to pay a mortgage and host a show. The Auditor General had raised concerns about the two events in his reports, but when Janet Phillips, who served as Permanent Secretary in the Ministry from 2015 to 2018, appeared before the Public Accounts Committee, she explained she approved the Mother's Day show for underprivileged mothers. The thrust of that particular show was that it was for underprivileged mothers who, had, who came from dysfunctional families. And on one day in a year, an organization that is an NGO for which support can be given would, would present a list of the mothers who they thought were deserving based on the circumstances. They would be treated to a nice Mother's Day lunch, which a lot of underprivileged people probably can't go to restaurants to enjoy. And, and then based on how they lived in the community and interact, interacted, one or two of them would have received trophies in their honor. And, and then they, they, they actually got to see a show based on the whole ethos of the fund and the fact that we were the Ministry of Community and Social Care and stuff like that. When the, the, rec the case came up to me, I, I could not say no because I thought it was a good effort based on what it was about. It Meanwhile, coordinator of the Poverty Alleviation and Eradication Program, Sonia Hamblin, told the Public Account Committee monies were used to pay the mortgage of a female who had been diagnosed with a terminally ill disease. She said the situation merited the disbursement of the funds. What is the spirit of this fund? Why in a situation like this and where the person is not working now, cannot work right now, um, and will be really stressed by continual calls to pay the mortgage, which does not help, even if it's just a cut on your finger, anybody continually coming at you does not help. So her health, in my opinion, would also be under threat. I thought to myself, I can't see any reason why a fund that can pay rent, can do housing repairs, in an extenuating circumstance, that's how it looked to me like this, couldn't offer some assistance here. It seemed to be catering to the same need. And so I would have put a case to the, to the PS explaining why I think it should be considered. In other news this Friday, Barbadian attorney at law Roberta Clark was today elected to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Clark said it was an honor to have been elected to the commission and declared her intention to accelerate social justice and end historical inequalities, including those based on gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and social status. Prime Minister Mia Motley described her election as a significant achievement for Barbados and the region. Bring the budget. President of the Democratic Labour Party, Verla de Pisa, today demanded that the Mia Motley administration deliver a national budget as a matter of urgency, as she charged that the ship of state is rudderless and sinking fast. Her call came in response to suggestions from the government's senior economic advisor, Dr. Kevin Greenwich, that government has been transparent in its financial dealings, even without the traditional budget. The Prime Minister is alive and well. The productive sectors are non-productive. And we have five ministers of finance standing idly by saying not a word. Now one advisor has the audacity to say that there is no need for such a budgetary statement as government is being transparent in its financial dealings. In today's COVID-19 update, the death toll from the virus moved to 191 as two elderly Barbadian men died on Thursday. One of them was 86 years old, while the other was 79. They passed away at the Blackman and Gollop and Harrison's Point Isolation Facilities, respectively. They were both unvaccinated. Meanwhile, a total of 284 persons, 130 males and 154 females, tested positive out of 1,659 tests conducted on Thursday. Of the new cases, 56 persons were under the age of 18 and 228 were 18 years and older. There were 962 people in isolation facilities and 6,803 in home isolation. There's regional and international news after this short break. 
Hi, I am Onika. I am a mother, I am a daughter, and I'm a wine educator. When vaccines first came on the scene last year, I was really apprehensive about getting vaccinated. I was worried about taking a drug that I felt was experimental. So at first, I really wasn't about it. I decided to get vaccinated. I had to acknowledge the fact that I am asthmatic and my son is also asthmatic. I have a career in wine. We depend on our senses and I decided that I did not want to risk it for being afraid of taking a vaccine. Coronavirus has affected everyone around the globe. And keeping this in mind, make sure that your decision is not a selfish one and that you're thinking of the benefits of the whole. Let's roll up our sleeves and get back to living. To regional news, Guyana's President Irfan Ali today announced a safe program to tackle crime, which has been on the decline. He pledged to introduce tougher penalties for gun offenders, among other things. Crime has been decreasing, but we are still not satisfied. That is why we are going to strengthen our regional capacity. We are investing in human resource training and development. We are improving the working condition and we are going to improve the whole welfare package for our men and women in uniform. And we are going to hold them more accountable. Greater presence is needed and we are going to incentivize those who are high performers. These are the things we'll be doing. We're not hiding from any issue. You do not have a president who will hide from any issue. I am going to be upfront in dealing with every issue that challenges the people of this country. On the international scene, two weeks of the UN COP26 climate talks in Glasgow blew past a deadline on Friday as the conference president called on countries to make a final push to secure commitments that would rein in the rising temperatures that threaten the planet. Banging the drum for ambitious action, a call to put a stop to climate catastrophe. World leaders are working around the clock to strike a deal as the COP26 climate change summit enters its final stages on Friday. Negotiators in Glasgow are hammering out an agreement to limit global temperature rises by dramatically reducing emissions. But it will need unanimous consent from the nearly 200 nations attending. And as Cassie Flynn, a UN strategic advisor in climate change, explains, traditionally, these summits never end on time. Well, these cops are a long haul. They are two weeks. Often they can be three weeks for, for many delegations and have some of these pre-conversations. And when we reach this point in the COP, you essentially have room after room of negotiators sitting around tables, looking at documents on screen, and going line by line and word for word. And this is really tough stuff. They often go through the night trying to come to areas of compromise these texts. In the latest draft text of the agreement, language around the phasing out of fossil fuels has been diluted in a bid to get a deal done, and it fails to offer the rolling annual review of climate pledges that some developing countries have pushed for, but Washington in particular opposed. It also lacks detail on future payments from the rich countries that are primarily responsible for global warming to the poorer countries that will take the brunt of worsening storms, droughts, floods, and rising sea levels. Some attendees feel despondent. We don't, we don't have any more time. We need to be faster and making sure we are not getting to a point that there is no turning back. And we are there. With the commitments that were already made, we are not going to meet the 1.5 that we are trying to keep alive in, in this COP. So we should be more firm and aggressive. And if they are weakening the language, that is disappointing. That's news, but for the very latest, visit our website at www.barbidastoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, or like us on Facebook. And sign up for our breaking news alerts via WhatsApp. 
We're also on Izumi Media and Bus Terminals, as well as Screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. You can also hear us on Mix 96.9 FM and Capital Media HD 99.3 FM.